our first presenter of the day is going to be Sarv Danjal, and she's going to be talking about uh, the future of the insights professional, which it has been a crazy dynamic past couple of years for our profession. So I'm very excited to hear about this particular topic, which is on the minds of everybody. So I'm going to disappear. I'm going to let Sarv do her thing, and I'm going to circle back in a little bit to, to lead some Q&A, but otherwise, shut my mouth. So Sarv, you all set to get rolling? Great. Thank you, Bill. And I'll open up with a question, uh, a question that I hope you are asking yourselves as to why you're attending today. In a world where we're, the data is infinite and growing and where human behavior is unpredictable, complex, how will you ensure as an insight professional that you will continue to provide value in the organizations that you work in and remain invaluable. If you have a similar thought or a question, or if you haven't thought about this question, I implore you to be thinking about this question in your career because we are at the tip of a very seismic shift. And what I mean by that is if we look back at history, I'll go on and talk about what those shifts incurred, but where are we today? So three areas that I'd like to cover with you all today, and please do feel free to send Bill some questions or ask me to pause if you'd like me to explain or elaborate on anything in particular. But we're gonna talk about the changing landscape of our industry. Now you're going to hear me talk about consumer insights, analytics, market research, I'm using those interchangeably. They mean the same thing in the context of this webinar. We will talk about the modern skills that I believe and recommend that are gonna be important for you attending this, this conference today and for future insight leaders. And how do we prepare for that going forward in the future? So those are the three broad brush strokes that I'm gonna to cover today and happy to elaborate in any one of those in particular. So. I talked about seismic shifts, and let's just think about some of the shifts that have taken up across the world, right? In the world that we live in. And as we look back at history, and we look at these particular shifts that took place, they changed the world, right? From the printing press, which allowed dissemination of information like never before, to the industrial revolution, in growing manufacturing, empowering labor uh, societies and teams and industries to the advent of electricity, which allowed us to communicate uh, in a way that we've never communicated before. Who can forget the digital age of the internet boom, right? Um, that fundamentally changed many ways that we work, the way we communicate, the way we source information. And today, the AI surgency is here. I will say that we've all heard AI, right? In, in our business, in the line of business that we're in, which is in the business of observation, the business of understanding human behavior, AI has been banded around for the last five years, if not earlier. In fact, it was with us a very, very long time ago, but it exploded after the pandemic. And I will say that if you haven't begun to experiment with AI, to learn with AI, you are already behind. So big technological changes are here today with us, and it is transforming the way we work in our insight and analytics industry. And so as I move on to the next slide, I wanna talk about that this is just the beginning with AI. It is truly unstoppable. The rise is reshaping how we do our work. And you've heard this in many conferences, I'm sure. But I want you to be thinking about these statistics as to the impact and the disruption it is having on our industry and will continue to. You can guess what this number pertains to. We're in the industry of business and numbers, right? 67,000 AI platforms, companies were launched in 2023. 
let that sink in, 67,000 companies. Yeah, I can imagine the number of companies that knock on your door. They certainly be knocking on my door to be able to do insights and market research and analytics cheaper, faster, better. But this number is growing and it will have grown by the end of this webinar. There is an investment globally of $25.2 billion in AI in 2023. So you can imagine the scale that this is going to take hold in one year, two year, three year, four years, we will look back and understand that in the future. But I want you to just remember those statistics because if you are not using AI in some shape or form, and I'm gonna come and talk to you on how that can uh, enable you as insight professionals, you will be left behind. So, AI is being adopted. It's particularly evident in more industries. Generative AI is the next future scalability area, I would say, with private investments skyrocketing. And you can see the number here, the 25.2 billion that was just invested in generative AI in 2023. So it's not going away. And it's really important that we understand how it can enable us to become insight professionals of the future. So our job as insight professionals, data analytics, supporting our marketing partners, supporting our innovation partners, or if you're at the agency side, supporting your clients is all about understanding consumers and human behavior. And it is a challenge in the rapidly evolving and changing world we live in. Just think about how our lives have changed over the last five years. Consumers have more ways to discover products and brands. They have more ways to shop. They have more ways to be enticed and, and to be attracted towards a brand or a service. And there's faster ways to make a purchase, right? I mean, you've all probably experienced it yourself. You can click to buy a product and it will be with you in 24 hours, if not earlier. And our job is to support our marketing folks, our innovation folks to drive the growth and understand what consumers want. And it's becoming really tough given the abundance of data, given the way in which we can collect information. It is in a, in a complete explosion. So we are very important and crucial in anticipating the rapid change. If we continue, and I'm not suggesting any of us are continuing to do this, but if we continue to be data gatherers, report generators, uh, conduits in passing information from one inbox to another, we will fail. We will be outsourced. And we are well poised to make the change. And I'm gonna show on and talk about how we will make that change. To succeed, and we're very good at the what, I will say that. We have lots of tools, lots of data telling us what is actually occurring with human beings, whether that's consumers, shoppers, audiences. But the emphasis has to be on the why. These are the pivots of today. Why are people behaving the way they are? And not only why are they doing what they're doing, what are they going to do next? So market research or consumer insights back in the day, and even in some organizations today, it's very task oriented. This may resonate with you. You get a brief from your marketeer, you look at that brief, you recommend the right approach, the right method, and you answer the brief. And you do that very, very well. I'm here to tell you that's not gonna cut it going forward. We then provide the data. Here's the data, here's the report. You spent hours with your agencies, or if you're at the vendor um, side of the businesses, working with your clients, refining the report, making the recommendations, trying to create impact on that report, spending endless hours on those PowerPoint decks, and then issuing those. You're also faced with juggling, quite frankly, a number of projects. Insights are thin on the ground in many, many organizations, and multiple projects are being handled at, at the same time, 
multiple stakeholders. You're pushed or pulled in many various di different directions. I understand it's difficult, but you must expand your mindset. This is where it starts to shift from a service provider to one of a strategic enabler. And we'll talk a little bit about those skills, but in order to do that, it really starts with the way you think. Expanding your mindset to be thinking from a growth perspective, a critically commercial perspective, and also rethinking in the ways that you do your work. And that is where AI can also help but also how you engage with your internal stakeholders. This is going to become critical. I firmly believe if we continue to operate in those four boxes, we will not have a role going forward. And we won't have a role because the data that is available in abundancy in real time with many companies knocking on our doors, telling us that they can provide the data at infinite detail um, is just one way of us having to harness all of that. We have to transform ourselves from the conduit, from the support function. I'm not saying don't support your stakeholders. I'm, I'm asking you to, imploring you to think differently on how you support, how you show up. You have to become strategic partners leading with meaningful insights, not reporting the data, that will drive an action, that will drive an outcome, because you have to stay ahead of these changes. We all do, including myself, because the world is changing and that's not going to stop. That's a constant. It is constantly going to evolve. So we need to move away from order taker support thinking to strategic partner driving decisions. In the industry, you must be hearing different vernacular now. Before it was all about data analytics, we're slowly moving to decision intelligence. Those are ingrained in all the data that we have, including insights. So if you're in analytical roles, be thinking about how you leverage the data to inform the outcome versus delivering the data. That's going to be equally important going forward. And why is that important? Because our landscape has changed and is continuing to change. We have very different data collection methods now from the traditional ways of market research. In today's world, as you know, there's um, instant capture of information. There's ways that companies can collect information to the individual in terms of what they're purchasing, when they're purchasing it, where were they, what else did they buy? This is first party data. Not everybody obviously has access to that, but more and more companies are engaging in that. And I want to be able to say to you here that the way in which our data is collected is very finite. And you're probably experiencing that, um, especially if you're in the media world of insight and market research. There is so much data in the system that let's just think about social media for, for a minute. Now you can monitor how consumers are feeling about your product, about your brand. It's instant and it's out there for everybody to see. And who are they engaging with? Who are they when they posted something on Instagram or what did they say on X? All of this is in the public domain for us to really understand what people are thinking and feeling about our products and our brands. And if you're not engaging in sort of clickstream data, um, you will be and you should be soon. I mean, it goes from Google Analytics all the way to Adobe Analytics, um, all the way through to Crazy Egg, Matoma. I mean, the list goes on in terms of what you can gather on people. It is a far cry from how market research data was collected through surveys. That still has a place and it still continues, but the advancement has been absolutely extraordinary. There's a greater emphasis to make sense of all of that information. What does it mean? I'm sure that resonates with many of you on, on this webinar, your internal stakeholders saying, well, that's great, but what do I do with this? What does it actually mean? The emphasize is translating data and information into meaningful translation. 
what does this mean for you, brand manager, on your brand or on your product? How is this going to drive growth? There's a real emphasis on that in our industry now and will continue. The third change in our landscape is the technology integration. I'm not asking you to become IT experts, far from it, but I am asking you to start dating your IT leadership. And this is a figure of speech. <laughs> uh, I need you, and, and you really need to be doing this, is having some very pertinent conversations with your IT folks on how you can harness data that is sitting in silos. And we're going to come and talk a little bit about that and connect it and join it up to have your own insight stack. You've heard of tech stacks. Insight stacks will be future game changers. And we'll, we'll cover that a bit later on in today's session. Because the demand for real time understanding is now almost mandatory table stakes in many organizations. And the pandemic really was the catalyst for that. I think two uh, major functions during the pandemic were really challenged internally. HR on how to navigate that change with people and the insight market research analytics industries on tell us what's happening, what is going to happen next, how long is the pandemic going to remain, how will this change behavior? And that has kept that thread in terms of understanding the why and what's next in real time as a shift in our landscape. So these are very large, broad shifts, and there's a lot of detail behind of all of these, which I can certainly answer questions to as we go throughout the presentation. Okay, but your new responsibilities as insight professionals have to shift. We talked a little bit about the task, order taker, support function, mindset, and operating style to moving towards a strategic business partner. I fully believe we can do this. I really do. Very few functions have oversight to all the data. You sit in that seat where you have privy to all the data with your insight partners, with your analytic partners. So moving towards a strategic business partner that is able to guide the organization, guide the internal stakeholders, is what the game changer pivot should be now in terms of skill set going forward, because our work should be ingrained in driving the outcome. So decision insights is going to be pivotal for success going forward. Don't be precious about the information. This has been a term that has been around for quite some time around democratizing the information give access to the people who need access, make sure they're right, using the data in the right way, the insights in the right way. And if people don't have access, give them access. It is not our role to hold on to this information. It is our role to collaborate internally with our stakeholders and socialize the insights and outcomes that impact those different stakeholders, whether that is marketing, innovation, R&D, supply chain, finance, and the list goes on. So you want to be able to be the leader to activate those insights across your cross-functional partners to, de to start demonstrating the value. This third bullet point is incredibly important given the constant rapid change we are in from a technology perspective because it is challenging our traditional methods. You know, about 10, 20 years ago, there were a handful of suppliers. You can name them the big ones that we used to work with and very set traditional methods. Today, that landscape looks very different and it will continue to morph and evolve. I implore you to spearhead experimentation on methods and approaches so you can stay ahead, so you can stay relevant and pioneer insights in ways that will maintain relevancy within your organization. And champion with your IT partners connecting the information and data. There must be hundreds of projects in individual verticals whether you're supporting marketing or 
innovation or design centric verticals with user experience insights or your sensory folks in R&D or your shopper insights, there must be hundreds of projects within those silos. The real power is to connect them within the vertical, first and foremost, so that you learn from your history, but the value is when it all comes together. Now, many few, few companies are doing this, namely the large CPGs, but this is going to catch up for everybody in some degree, small, medium, large. It will hit us all as the way we need to rethink the way in which we work. So skills that I'd love for you to be thinking about and that are going to be important, and I truly believe this, is that you all have to become data literate, not data experts, but certainly data literate. You need to lean on your partners who are the experts in data science and data um, analytical advanced predictive models and, and foresights, but you need to become data literate because you have to be proficient in analyzing various data sets now with all the abundance of the way in which data is collected. And you need to be able to start extracting meaningful insights from, from that data and that information. Allow the AI to help you with this, right? There are AI tools out there now very proficient at analyzing reams uh, of data and decks and can summarize for you. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that you take that as gospel. It is your job to apply the human nuances that machines miss, and they miss them all the time. It is your job to apply your knowledge, your experience to what the data set is telling you but allow the AI to save you the time. And there are some really good AI tools out there. In order for that to happen, you have to become tech savvy, right? And again, I'm not asking you to become IT experts, but you need to be familiar with AI. You need to be familiar with these machine learning tools and large language models, visualization techniques. There are a number of courses that are out there online for free that you should be engaging in and get certified for them. If anything else, they'll look good on your resume. But moreover, in looking at all the data and extracting meaningful insights that will inform decisions, you need to be able to free up that time to tell the narrative in a way that resonates with your stakeholders. And it's no longer acceptable to state the obvious. You're employed in your role as the voice of the consumer, the shopper, the human, to tell your stakeholders, what does it mean? What does it mean for, for my business? Why does the consumer behave in a certain way or the shopper shop in a certain way? Why are they buying what they're buying? What will they do next? It's your opportunity to connect those dots and translate and tell a narrative in a way that is not death by PowerPoint and is resonating with your audience. In order to do that, you have to become that strategic advisor, right? You have to know what's keeping your stakeholders up at night. And so you have to be adaptable. You know, with, with our methods being challenged, uh, quite frankly, our approaches being uh, changed con uh, in a very, very rapid way with the explosion of DIY platforms and the explosion of AI enabling you to do research faster, cheaper, not social, better, but certainly cheaper and faster, you're going to have to quickly learn new skills. You're going to have to learn to implement new tools and socialize with your stakeholders and stay ahead of those new methods that are really chomping at the bit behind us already. So these are very broad and, you know, I do implore you to start thinking about those skill set and looking through how you might be able to leverage these tools and technologies going forward. Because AI, as I mentioned very early on, it's here to stay, 
It's not going away. It is only going to scale and build further. So algorithms to predict consumer behavior and audience segments, lots of media agencies are already using this. Again, I'm not asking you if you're in a full service role to use them, but certainly challenge your media counterparts on how these are being applied. Um, because you want to be able to uncover those patterns. You want to be able to uncover um, audience insights or personalized targeting strategies because that's what consumers are demanding today. So machine learning, absolutely critical. Decision intelligence. If you're not using a decision platform, that's okay, right? If you don't have a process internally of how decisions are made, I would advise you lead that charge because again, this is the group of individuals and professionals in the industry that have privy to all the data. The data is there as a guide into decision-making processes. So analyzing information and predicting outcomes can be enabled with decision insight platforms, but I would start small by joining up information that you already have sitting in siloed areas and, in, and start to improve your internal decision-making processes. Social media listening. Now, the what, reason why I have signaled this one separately is because we are forever in an age and will continue to be in a digital space. And social media has been for many organizations and is beginning to be in many organizations critical to revealing insights about people, about humans, about what are they saying? How is the brand being appraised or talked about, about consumer sentiment? You can act quite swiftly um, with social media insights and trends to keep your brand agile and ahead of the curve. Now, there are many agencies out there, vendor partners out there that will talk to social listening analytics and tools and plugging in innovation ideas there to help you understand if this will land or not. So it's a very fertile space, I would say, in our industry right now that the social media data is being powered, is the backbone to help understand how innovation and certainly marketing strategies will land going into the future. So keep an eye out for these areas and start being curious about the methods, the approaches, the tools behind these, because these are going to be the tools that will be steadfast going forward. And I talked a little bit about the connectivity of data. Now, this is not for everyone. Like I said, um, many of the big CPGs are already ahead in, in, in many ways around developing their own insight stack. What I mean by that is in our industry, we have a number of insight and data analytic professionals. And typically in an organization, they're very siloed. And that's what this visual is trying to depict. You have marketing insights around advertising, packaging, advertising tracking, brand tracking, et cetera, et cetera. You have user insights on how do you leverage those insights and turn those into design elements or ergonomics or, or even user experience on a website for, for the target that we're trying to entice. You have the innovation insights around products, services, new ways to go to market, Shopper Insights, obviously, all about supporting our sales partners as well, but talking about consumers and shoppers on how they shop, where they shop, why they do what they do, what is the full path to purchase. And of course, then you have the data arm behind all of this, which is really your syndicated data, uh, whether that's Kana or Nielsen or Numerator, and the list goes on there. The real game changer for the future is connecting all of this together as an insight stack. And I would start off small. I'm not suggesting this is for everybody, but the true power of the value is when we learn from our history and we learn from within the vertical. Ask yourselves the question, when was the last time you took a look back in your own verticals and conducted a meta-analysis? Ask yourself that question. If you haven't done it, I highly recommend you do. 
because doing the meta-analysis will help you avoid reinventing the wheel going forward. It is going to save you time in terms of repeating tests after test after test. So if we're able to conduct and um, cultivate the meta-learning within the vertical, that is a start. So start there, do it for one brand even, one segment, start small, and over time, build your meta learning. It is absolutely critical because when we come to then connect across the verticals, that's really how you create invaluable ROI for the organization. So this is game changing stuff and it's a little bit out there, but I will say the big CPGs are already engaging in this. So start small, Please do not ignore it. This is one page I really do not want you to forget. And the reason why I don't want you to forget that is because the future of our industry is incredibly changing at a fast pace. There is hyper-personalization occurring as we speak. People do not want to be spoken to as a mass. You'll hear a lot about digital marketing, affiliate marketing, but certainly in digital marketing, this is all around understanding down to the personalization level. And our industry really hasn't caught up with that, quite frankly, and we need to. It is going to be about ethical practices, given how data is being collected. You as custodians of market research or insight are going to have to engage in privacy practices uh, to protect the consumer. If you haven't already, that should be taking place already as we speak. The insight integration that I just talked about, this is the future. These are three things that we're already talking about, about the future. And the fourth is prediction. What is going to happen next? Not what has happened. Yes, lagging indicators, they have a purpose. You will create value by predicting and you're not going to get it right. We, you know, we would all have our own islands sipping margaritas if we did get it right on what is going to happen next with the most calculated risk you can put forward for your stakeholders. So our future is changing. The skills you need are changing and we have to start now. So prepare for the future. And how can you do that? Please continue to learn, you know, embrace the lifelong education. There are courses online that are free, really easy, and um, will provide certification, but continue to learn. You will need to have more strings to your bow. Depth of experience, it's okay. It's not going to get you ahead. If your ambition is to be the next insight leader of the future, you will be required to have a diverse skill set. We talked a little bit about it already, data literacy, technologically savvy, storytelling, adaptability, bringing that all together to tell the narrative that is in, ingrained in outcomes is the skill set that we're being asked already and which will be we will need for the future. How do you do all of that is through education, is through training courses, it's through trial and error and the power of the network. Please don't network with people when you need them. You should be networking with people every day, um, calling upon someone who may have a very different skill set to you to learn. And this is the real power of our industry. There are, there are forums, whether that's the Insight Association, uh, SOMR if you're in Europe, on how to engage with other networks. But please do not engage with a network when you need them, because that's when you'll be frantic and looking for the answer. You should be building that network as on a daily basis and form your own, for, cultivate your own network. Um, to share ideas and learn from one another. I spoke a lot and I, I'm aware of time and certainly want to answer, ask questions. But really, you know, the, the, the high level takeaways are, are these four. You know, we got to move away from that order taker kind of conduit of holding on and playing the post box, researcher, insight professional, data issuer. 
to a strategic business partner. Leverage the, the right AI tools for your organization and for your business and automation to remove the day-to-day -day tasks. Standardize your, your methodologies. Um, it'll make your life easier in the way in which you conduct those repetitive tests. Apply your knowledge and experience instead to guide the organization. That is where your headspace should be really spent. And one of those ways to do that, to create the headspace, is to democratize the information and data. Give access. Don't be precious about it. Nothing's going to happen. Your job's not going to be taken away. Give the access to the internal teams. Everybody needs to be at pace with you. But your job is to give meaning to it. Give meaning to what does this mean for your internal cross-functional teams to drive and guide your organization. And you have to be relevant. Think of yourselves as a brand. When brands stop being relevant, people stop buying them. In order for us to remain relevant, we have to experiment. Lead that charge. It may be just one method that you've evaluated in a year. Start somewhere, but embrace the mindset of, of learning and continuing to learn. As I mentioned, there's courses online, certifications uh, that can be gained, and it would only increase in terms of what's available. And start to be thinking about how do you join all your information together? I'm not asking you to create your insight stack tomorrow, but start small. It will save you time. It will save you money. Uh, bring past data and insights together. Demonstrate the value of those cumulative insights for really understanding the consumer holistically. Paint that picture holistically. In order for you to do that, you have to join up this information and data. You have to connect the dots. It will avoid duplicate, duplicative efforts for you. It will avoid repeating tests. But, con but connecting the insights with your data partners and your IT partners is the path forward. So I'm going to pause there because that's all I have for you. I have a lot more detail behind that, but I will pause and hand it over to Bill. There I am. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, I, for one, was very, very enjoying. Um, and yeah, questions, drop them into the... Uh, the Q&A or the chat, I will sort of moderate those. I know we had a couple come through from, from Sherry as you were talking. Uh, the term that you used for path forward instead of data analytics, she was she was asking about, just to refresh on that. Path forward, or do you mean decision intelligence versus data analytics? That to me is the, the pivot change. I mean, you know, um, just a few years ago, we heard, you know, um, syndicated data professionals being, prefer, you know, referred to as data analysts, right? Or that's the analytical team, or that's the business insights team, or that's the business analytics team. That's still relevant, but the, the nuance that I have seen in the industry, um, just looking at all the recent job openings over in the last year, there is this pivot to decision intelligence. Now that's ingrained in data. It absolutely is ingrained in the data, but the meaningful change is using that data to inform the outcome. And that's what we mean by decision intelligence. But that's kind of the new vernacular that's been, that certainly I have seen coming through in our industry. And who knows it, you know, the jobs are now being posted on decision intelligence analysts, <laughs> which really is around still the data. DIA, perhaps? I don't know. Yeah, DIA. <laughs> um, we did have another question come through from anonymous attendee who actually took the words out of my mouth, so I'm going to just read this out verbatim. Uh, how do you work on addressing a culture of change, uh, res in a, a culture, I, I think we're in a change-resistant re company? Um, they hear the word AI and want to jump on it, but are resistant to change anything and don't realize they need to make incremental changes before jumping to what's new and flashy. 
Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. Now, obviously, you have to think about the culture of your company. And I'll be bold as to say this, and, you know, I'll give you a few examples. If they're not listening, that's an insight. If they are not listening, they will be left behind. And if they're not listening to you, and you truly believe this is the right thing to do, you have to question yourself if you're in the right place. I'll be bold enough to say that. But it's hard. Um, you have to tiptoe into it slowly, right? You can't go from here and say, team, we're going to build an insight stack. Let me tell you, it's going to cost about a half a million dollars, but trust me, it's going to be great. <laughs> we will have heels digging in and saying, you, you know, you're off your head. You have to start small. And unfortunately, in our industry, there is a lot of proving to be done. Because historically, if you think about our functions, in many organizations, they support functions. They support marketing or, you know, sales or innovation or R&D. They're not constituencies in their own right. Very few, very few. But it starts with the top, with the C-suite. Are they consumer centric? If they are, you've got a shot, right? Because consumer centricity means placing the consumer and everything at the heart of what you do. And you're in the best place to do that with small changes, right? Whether that's doing the meta analysis, that's a good place to stop. Just with meta analysis on a brand, like what do you know about the brand of all the projects you spent half a million dollars on over the last two to three years? What is it telling you? Because you will then be able to tell your marketers or your innovation funds, no, you know that thing you wanted? Don't need to do that because of X, Y, Z, because you've done them. And start small and enlist. Um, and, you know, I know there are team members on, on this call, and certainly I've managed in the past, but you have to date your stakeholders. Again, not literally, but you've got to enroll them. And once you start socializing it with one advocate, word of mouth, a second advocate, a third advocate, you will see that ripple effect. Trust me when I say I have done this myself. I've been in resistant change organizations. It wasn't easy, but it was possible because I actually did get there. But you have to start small and you have to have partners in marketing with you and you have to have a sponsor internally as well. That really helps. I think we'll need a whole new webinar on that culture shift in the future, Bill. Indeed. Um, no, and it's, you know, it's something I always preach. I, I, I always say, you know, AB, AB and always be networking, right? Um, and that applies not only to, you know, events like this and getting out and doing networking, but internally is the dating of, you know, those stakeholders, those business partners, the folks that you may you know, interact with on a, you know, kind of ancillary basis. But if yeah. you are out there having those conversations and paying attention, that's how you can be part of, of that change. Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I, I love your your mention of, you know, the, the, the CPG cutting edge folks all the way down the very broad spectrum to those who are just heels dug in and don't want to hear about this information. Like, you know, yeah. depending on where you sit, you have to, to, you have to. approach differently, right? Right, right. Um, we did have a good segue uh, with regard to meta-analysis, and this is from Tina. Uh, in terms of conducting me internal meta-analysis, could you elaborate on the ethical or legal considerations and potential conflicts of interest involved in utilizing data that ha has an that was initially funded by a different client? I'm not sure I, I fully understand the question. If you have internal data, it's usually aggregated, right? Um, typically, you know, this is, let's start there with aggregated data, I think, to begin with. Um, because there's a lot to be said for all those projects that are sitting in some sort of electronic filing cabinet somewhere that have not been connected. So there's not an issue legally or ethically with that, right? When it comes to first party data, yes, there are strict privacy laws 
there are strict ethical considerations. I highly recommend you work with your, this is going to sound a little odd, but HR is going to become your best friend, number one, and IT are going to become your best friend, number two. And you have to work with them in the parameters of what is um, acceptable internally for your organization, as well as what you're willing to then share internally um, with your stakeholders, let alone what you share externally. There, there are some very strict rules on that. So you all know, even from qualitative research, you should not be quoting a single person with their name, their age, and then none of that. That's all gone away. Back in the day, we used to be able to do that, if you recall. This is Alison, age 35. She has two kids. You can't even put that on a page now. So it, it's a complex process. Um, too, too much time needed right now to fully answer it in, on how you do it. But certainly, you, you cannot do it in isolation. You have to engage your government affairs your PR folks, your IT folks, as well as your HR folks. Make sure you have some procedures in place and not to forget your legal counsel. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, let's see. There are many resistant companies, but there are also those that can replace all the researchers with AI. Yikes. Um, how can companies balance these behaviors? So I will say that I don't think companies can replace the insight professionals with AI. I will say that. the a Look, mis machines don't know your history in terms of the conversations you've had with your internal stakeholders. They also don't know what your business plans are going forward in terms of your strategic plans or your annual operating plans or what's keeping your C-suite up at night. They miss the human nuances. This is where you come in. AI is there as an enabler. It's going to remove some drudgery quite significantly. It, for you to concentrate uh, on, well, let me tell you where we need to be focusing our attention next. Here is where I see the growth occurring. Why do I believe in that? That's your point of view as the custodian of the consumer shopper data. So I don't believe that AI replaces our professionals. <laughs> it certainly will challenge, which is why we're having this conversation. And if you do not begin to delve into data literacy, being a little tech savvy, ensuring you know how to operate some of these platforms, yes, you will be replaced by someone who can. Indeed. Um, and I think that was it for Q&A, and we're about to bump up against our next talk, so I think it's a good time to conclude. Uh, Sar, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. The rest of our presenters are going to have big shoes to fill. That was that was really great. Um, a uh, real quick housekeeping item, and I think Sherry had asked about this in the chat. And yes, so uh, archived presentation. So we're going to post videos for all presentations today. Uh, we're also, when permitted, um, going to post PDFs of, of, of slide share outs. Um, so yes, be on the lookout for those to, to follow after, after our conclusion. Um, good job. You, All right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest <laughs> of the so virtual conference team. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Bill.